Good afternoon. Welcome to the Faculty of Public Affairs Spotlight event. Uh, my name is Stanley Philippe. Uh, we are in week two of our See You at Home webinar series, and it's been going really, really well. Um, super excited to be able to connect with you all uh, through Microsoft Teams. Um, this week, we've been spotlighting uh, many of our programs. Uh, we started with our Faculty of Engineering and Design, uh, the Sprott School of Business, and our Faculty of Science. But today is a day that's super special for me personally. You see, today we are drawing the attention to my faculty. See, back in 2004, yes, 2004, um, I graduated from what is now known as the Bachelor of Communication and Media Studies. And uh, my very first day at, at Carleton, my very first university class, I took a, a course on speech making and public speaking. And I gotta tell you, that course, uh, that, that year, that degree really changed my life. Um, ever since I graduated, I've been a member of the recruitment team here at Carleton University, and I get a chance to connect with all of you um, through our various recruitment initiatives. So this one is really close to heart, and I'm really excited to um, to showcase what our faculty has in store um, for you. If this is your first time using Microsoft Teams or checking in on one of our webinars, I, I want to thank you for, for joining us. And I want to draw your attention to our Q&A um, uh, function. Uh, we want to hear from you. So please take the time, ask questions throughout today's session. Uh, we have members of every single department represented uh, here uh, in our event. And so we want to really hear from you, hear what you have to say, the questions you have about your future uh, degree program. Um, you're also going to get a chance to hear and see uh, from many members um, of our faculty. And, uh, and I'll be along, uh, the, uh, along for the ride uh, to help you uh, with your questions too. So if you have any questions for the specific faculties that you see uh, or departments you see showcased uh, in our live event, um, Feel free to ask them. We'll publish them in the Q&A published section, section, and I will um, ask those questions on your behalf. So I'll be the, the voice of the people uh, for today. Um, to start today's uh, webinar, uh, we want to uh, really set the groundwork and, and give you a great overview of what the faculty is all about. And to do so, I'd like to invite um, our Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs, uh, Mr. Andre Plourd, to say a few words. So the next person you're gonna see on screen uh, is Andre. So Andre, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Stanley, and welcome everybody to the webinar for the Faculty of Public Affairs. As Stanley has explained, we're going to do this in basically two parts. First part is I'm going to speak about the faculty overall, kind of how we fit together, and then you're going to have the opportunity to hear from almost all of the programs that are offered by units in the Faculty of Public Affairs, have a chance to ask questions of all of them, have a chance to have general questions where somebody else from the university can help answer. So without further ado, maybe we could go to the next slide. Great, so I think what this tells you now essentially is what we are in the Faculty of Public Affairs. So all in all, there are 12 academic units in the faculty. Those that are highlighted on the screen are the ones where uh, bachelor's programs are offered. So the kinds of programs that you're considering right now are offered in all of those units. The other thing I want to highlight is the fact that we have all in all about 8,000 students in the faculty. About 6,500 of them are enrolled in bachelor's programs. So it is a big faculty that includes a large number of programs and a lot of different types of programs. Again, the, I know that you're, you know, choosing a university, choosing a program of study is a really complicated set of questions to answer, and especially in these times uh, that we're facing now. But I want to assure you that all of us here in the Faculty of Public Affairs are in your corner. We want you to succeed. We want you to come to us and kind of learn from us and participate in who we are. And at the same time, we want to, uh, for you to be successful. I want to make sure that you know that all of the first year courses that you'll be taking this year, this fall, will be offered remotely. So that means that it will be offered through the internet, 
There will be no courses offered here on campus at Carleton, so you, but you will receive the same high quality education uh, from these courses right from the safety of your own home. So this is kind of who we are, is what we are, and the next slide is about who we are. And so this basically brings together five big ideas around which the faculty uh, coalesces. So if you ask people around, what are we all about? Who do we, what kind of ideas do we identify with? Those are those ideas. So the first one has to do with governance and public policy. Almost all of our programs have major elements as part of them that study in one way or another the role of government in our societies. And so that kind of sets apart the programs of the Faculty of Public Affair, Affairs from other programs offered at Carleton. Many of our students uh, studying in the, are studying in these areas very intensively. A lot of our alumni, as you would expect, are in fact working directly in this area. You can't be too surprised at that. After all, we are in Ottawa. It is Canada's capital. It is a huge advantage for us. We can talk about this a little bit later. It means that a lot of the professors that you will be working with have close partnerships with different government agencies or departments. They have close partnerships with some non-governmental organizations or international uh, societies that are headquarters he, headquartered here in Ottawa. And basically, you have to remember, uh, the diplomatic community is essentially in our backyard. Basically, embassies and high commissions are here in Ottawa. Number of our programs have built special relationships with either some or a large number of these embassies and high commissions. And it kind of is a way of enriching the experience that you can have when you come to us. Second big idea, or second and third big idea, our focus on building a better society and building better democracy. So for us, fundamentally, our students are interested in making a difference in the world. That's the kind of student that comes to programs offered by the Faculty of Public, Public Affairs. Students, you will learn how to make a difference in the world, how to improve our societies, how, how to work for to enhance uh, de democracy. There's a number of ways in which for that you can do this. First of all, two examples that come to mind are the placements and the practicums that are available through our Bachelor of Social Work and the Bachelor of Arts in Criminology and Criminal Justice. Both groups really work hard to build linkages in with, the, with their communities and therefore give you some experience right in, to make a difference in our societies right within the programs. Next big idea is about informed citizenships. It's citizenship. So bachelor's degrees really are helping you develop a sense of what it means to be an active citizen of your city, of our pro your province, or our country. So this is a way essentially of taking what you learn and applying it across, uh, across your areas of interest. Finally, we are about addressing regional and global challenges. And that means for us, international learning experience are an integral part of what we do in the Faculty of Public Affairs. And in preparation for the fall terms and the limitations that we're facing as a result of that, Professors have been working to modify courses so that this experience can be achieved at home without traveling internationally. So there's no need for you to fear that you're going to have to have to have to go abroad in order to develop some kind of ex of uh, experience, at least for the fall term. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now in a very highly creative way, we have put all the programs together as to which building uh, the department or the unit that offers the program uh, is located. So what you have before you first is Richcraft Hall. This is the our newest building in the Faculty of Public Affairs. 
All of the programs that you see listed here are offered either through the School of Journalism and Communication, that's the Bachelor of, of uh, Communications and Media Studies, the Bachelor of Journalism, the Bachelor of uh, Media Production and Design, or the Institute of European, Russian and Eurasian Studies, the BA in uh, European and Russian Studies. You'll have the opportunity to learn more about all of these programs later on in this session. Next slide, please. So this is basically the, the low building is essentially where the faculty uh, used to be at its core in a sense that most of the units started here and then spread across the faculty across the, the the university. So as you can tell, a number of programs are headquartered in the low building. Again, you'll have the opportunity to, to learn about all of these programs. Uh, the, later on in this presentation, everything from criminology and criminal justice to law to uh, economics, political science, uh, all of these programs will be discussed later on in the session. And finally, the last building in which uh, faculty of public affairs uh, programs are headquartered is the Dunton Tower. The, we have brand new facilities that people will be moving into over the course of the summer for the Bachelor of Global and International Studies. And then the Bachelor of Social Work uh, basically has all of its facilities, including research labs and stuff like this, uh, in the Dunton Tower. So this, what's particularly interesting about the Dunton Tower is it has a beautiful view of the campus, of the Rideau Canal, of Dow's Lake and of the Rideau River. So it is kind of a, a re, an interesting way of seeing the city, but also and the university within its geographical context. So this is a bit of an overview of what we have here in the Faculty of Public Affairs. I'm happy to take some of your questions uh, if you wish. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Andre, uh, for that uh, awesome overview. And uh, like Andre just mentioned, we want to hear from you. So if you have any questions for uh, the Dean of uh, your Faculty of Public Affairs, uh, please go ahead and ask those questions now. We'll try to get to um, as many as we can uh, during the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, but while we're waiting for those questions, Andre, I've got a question for you. Uh, you referenced um, our location here in Ottawa. Um, what are some of those advantages that, that Carleton has uh, and specifically this faculty has in being located uh, in the nation's capital? Well, I'll start with something quite straightforward in the sense that a lot of the subject matters that we look at are of, re of interest to people working in Ottawa. So we have a lot of people who actually work in Ottawa who bring their expertise on campus basically to teach uh, some of our courses. So we've got a lot of the professionals working in government or in, the, in public service more generally, that will come here and teach some of our courses, bringing what they know about their experiences to the classroom. So a lot of political staffers have come to, to, talk, to teach for us, a lot of some speech writers, people who uh, are, are journalists or lawyers or economists for working for government or for uh, NGOs, for example, will come and teach here. It makes a huge difference. It makes us such a much richer learning environment, but also offer learning opportunities to our students that are simply not available in, uh, off, uh, outside of Ottawa. It is this, this connection that allows, it's this two-way street in the sense of bringing expertise on campus. And similarly, the fact that a number of our professors work on issues of interest to the public, se to public sector, including, uh, including NGOs and international organizations, makes a difference. It makes us quite different. It enriches our programs and the experience that our students can have. The other thing is it also means that we take advantage of, of the physical location in a different way. For example, a number of our students will uh, will be interns on Parliament Hill. If you're interested in politics or the political processes, you can work for a minister, you can work for uh, a political party, you can work for a member of parliament, for example. In other cases, if you think of, uh, of uh, courses in law, for example, the proximity 
of the Supreme Court is something that is interesting to, to the students, is something that is enriches the experience, but that and that is not available elsewhere in Ottawa. So I think there's a two-way connection here. We take advantage of our location by building linkages from campus to the community, but we also are privileged in the sense that some of the members of the community come and bring their expertise and share it with our students. And there, there was a question here about, about job outcomes, and I'm sure those two approaches, having access to community members and, and bringing the community to campus can lead to some really great outcomes. So uh, maybe you can touch on, uh, you mentioned a little bit about some of the different um, jobs that, that could come out of a, uh, a degree in public affairs. So as we have been, we have tracked uh, over the years. We've tracked more than ten thousand of uh, graduates from with the degrees from offered by units in the Faculty of Public Affairs, and so looked at the job outcomes that these people have had. All of this information is available on our website at carlton.ca backslash fpa, and the, the the tab if you want on the website is called career paths, and so you can look at what typically. What kinds of jobs have people obtained after degrees in the Faculty of Public Affairs? You can't be too surprised, given our location, that a lot of our graduate end up working for government in one form or another. And so that is a big part of who we are. It's a big part of what our students and our gra the graduates of our programs end up doing. The other, what's interesting, however, is that you can also see the broad reach of our students. A number of our students end up in the professions, for example. So we'll use a degree in the obtained in the Faculty of Public Affairs to pursue further studies and, become, and go to law school, for example. So there's a lot of information on our website dealing with exactly that sort of issue look at how broad the range of experiences are across the degree programs. And keep in mind what's interesting is that each degree opens a lot of doors. It's not like this, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. You do this degree, this is the kind of position that you get. You can see there's a, a rich array of different types of outcomes that our students uh, have obtained once they've uh, secured a degree from the faculty. Awesome, thank you for that update, uh, Andre. Now, uh, what about activities um, outside of the classroom? So for students who are in the faculty, you know, when they're not uh, necessarily uh, spending time in the classroom, what are some of the activities that are available for them to uh, participate in? Okay, great. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Stanley. I think the issue for us has been experiential learning. So kind of learning once you're applying what you've learned in a classroom in a, in a real world type of environment is something that we also privilege in the faculty. So we are big participants in the co-op program, for example. A number of our programs have internships or placement components. Both of those mean that you essentially go from campus and go in a work environment either on, on, either full time or during when you're studying or taking other courses uh, to obtain that kind of experience. So that's something that students in the Faculty of Public Affairs will have the opportunity to do as part of their degree program. We also offer uh, a, a number of undergraduate research opportunities. You can design your own project for everything from designing your own project research project to working with a faculty member on or a professor on one of their own projects. Summer uh, summer and summer programs where students, for example, will, will be supported to go and do some do their research projects over the course of the summer. We've got a number of student societies. Almost every unit in the faculty has a, an undergraduate student society that kind of promotes events that are specific to that degree program. We also have a special program that we call the FPA Ambassadors, and they're basically here to kind of help us present the faculty to students, to people who come to visit us on campus. They are hosts on, on the many of the public events that we hold on campus, or this year we'll be hold this fall we'll be holding them uh, some of these online, so they, they really are participating in the life of the faculty in ways that uh, that really, I think, contribute to building them 
uh, to building their success for, uh, for the future. As I said, we have a number of uh, faculty-wide events. We have lectures, we have all kinds of conferences on campus. So there's real opportunity to step a little bit outside of the degree program that you want to participate in and then kind of enrich your experience while you're here with us at Carleton. Awesome, now there was a question about uh, first year registration and I just wanna uh, mention to the folks out there who um, either are holding offers or who've accepted their offer of admission, uh, once you do accept, uh, we will be emailing you in the coming weeks uh, to tell you more about uh, registration itself. So the process, how to register, how to access our site. But what I wanna ask you, Andre, is um, if there are some special courses that students might wanna look out for uh, in year one uh, as they enter into their, uh, their degree program. Yes, I think, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that most first year class are relatively large, so you'll be in there with a lot of different uh, of students, but there are two things that I'd like to highlight. First is that there's a number of courses that are available to students across a number of programs in the faculty where there's a really hands-on component from the outset. Some of these courses are offered by journalism, some of these courses offered by social work and in media production and design, but also more broadly. But there are courses that really are kind of there from your first year to let you ex experiment with material as you go along. The other thing I want to highlight is that we do have what's called first year seminars, which essentially are small groups. So courses offered to relatively small groups of students talking about a maximum of 30 students in, in a course with a professor that are essentially structured around special topics by and large. So if you think, for example, in, in communication and media studies, in this fall, there will be a, a, a seminar called Truth, Post-Truth and News. So it is a way of trying to put together special types of topics, but in a way that's quite focused that will help uh, students develop a broad range of skills, again, in a small group environment. Similarly, in, uh, in political science, for example, a first year seminar on offer this year will be Canadian Indigenous relations. You can well imagine kind of taking that from a political science perspective and again, bringing this to a relatively small number of students to have a really rich experience engaging with that topic. So I think these are courses and these and a number of other courses uh, are offered as first year seminars. And I would encourage students to consider taking them. It's a different type of experience. It's something than, than, a, than a large first year class. It really gives you the opportunity to get in depth into a specific topic that you might be really interested in. Now, before we, we let you uh, go, because we do have um a lot of different folks we want to hear from uh, this afternoon. I, I wanted to ask you um, if you have like uh, some bit of advice that you want to give to our, our future students as they enter into their undergraduate degree. What type of advice would you give them to make the most out of their degree program? Well, I think for us, as, as I've tried to highlight through all of this, there's so many opportunities to get involved outside of the immediate area of your degree program. And I think that's part of the really exciting thing uh, in the Faculty of Public Affairs. There's so many things that you can get involved uh, with uh, as you do your program. And I would really encourage students to take advantage of those uh, when they're with us in, in their degree program. So it's not just about the specific degree program that you've got. There are a number of ways you can attend lectures, these are all, for example, you can participate as an FPA ambassador. You can become very active in a student society. All of these are ways to complement the experience that you get as part of your degree program. You'll enjoy it. You'll meet really interesting people and you'll look back once you finish your degree and really think highly of the experience that you've gotten. I think those are great words uh, to, to leave things at. So thank you so much, Andre, for, for this uh, amazing overview. Um, uh, our Dean will stay online with you all. So if you have any questions for Andre, please again, keep asking them in the Q&A and Andre will be able to answer them uh, through the uh, Q&A um, as well.
So what we're going to be doing now is uh, is hearing uh, from our various departments. And we have a lot of amazing departments uh, in the Faculty of Public Affairs. And so they'll be able to give you a, an update, uh, give you a bit of an overview of what's happening in the department, what you have to look forward to. And then again, we want to answer your questions. So when you see uh, a, a on the slide or the PowerPoint, if you see uh, a, the name of the department, that means that they are uh, being spotlighted. And so they're able to answer some of your questions live and we'll take some of those questions um, uh, for you. Um, and then again, they will stay online throughout the uh, entire event. So if there are additional questions that you want to ask, uh, we do encourage you to do so again through uh, the event uh, Q&A. So um, the first person I'm going to ask to, uh, to appear on screen uh, is Vincent Andrezani. He is a member of the Bachelor of Communication and Media Studies. Uh, Vincent, uh, the uh, screen is yours. Great, thanks, Stanley. Appreciate it. Um, so my name is Vincent Andrusani. I'm a faculty member in Communication and Media Studies here at Carleton, and I teach the first year introductory courses to the program, as well as a fourth year, uh, a fourth year course in media production. Now, being the instructor in of the intro courses, what I thought I'd do is take the next five or so minutes to tell you a bit about them and how they help prepare our students to work through the comms and media studies program more broadly. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll end with a couple quick thoughts about the program and some possibilities for extracurricular student participation. And once that's done, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have if there are any. Um, if not, then maybe I'll tell you a little bit more about the first year courses in terms of how they're organized and uh, the types of the type of work that students produce um, while they're in them. For the uh, for the remainder of the session, myself and my colleague, Dr. Irina Knezovic, who's the chair of the the, uh, the communication undergrad program, we'd be happy to take any questions you might have through the chat box. OK, so the courses, there are two mandatory courses in the first year of the BCOMS program. The first one runs in the fall and the other runs in the winter semester. The course in the fall is titled uh, Foundations in Communication and Media Studies, and it does precisely that. Um, it begins building the foundations of the discipline. It's organized according to some of the many media that we use today, and it gravitates mainly around the idea of media history. So understanding the origins of our media and how they've been used across different historical moments and across different cultures. Um, so some of the media that we cover in this course are writing and printing, images and photography, radio and audio media, television, digital media, and of course, social media. And so we also spent some time thinking about the relationship between these media and the economy. So a media industries and a mass communication approach informs the work that we do throughout uh, much of the semester. But it's also important to note that this class also offers the opportunity to begin building a language to discuss communication and media. This is something that we need to be able to speak about media. It's something we need not only for the first year, but it's it's a key part of the program and the discipline more broadly. Now, the course that runs in the winter semester is called Current Issues in Communication and Media. And it's at that point that we kind of pivot away from media history and we look at more um, contemporary topics in the discipline. So we begin by learning about the dominant paradigms in communication studies today, and we use these paradigms to think through a series of topics, um, popular culture, uh, film, gaming, online communities, cancel culture, um, environmental communication, and, and smart cities are some of the topics that we offer or that we cover. Um, now this offers students a sense of uh, some of the current issues in the field while it also gets them acquainted with the sort of thinking and uh, critical approaches that the discipline is built on. OK, so uh, now how does all this help stu uh, set students up for the rest of the program and the program in general? Well, uh, the foundations of the field underpin most any course students will take throughout their degrees. And so the language and the media explorations that we do in first year uh, form the basis of what the rest of the program expands and it develops. But just as important is that some of the many topics that we cover in first year, they end up being primers for dedicated courses throughout the rest of the program. For instance, you know, there's an upper division course called um, visual media, uh, another called environmental communication, 
another called game studies. And all of these are topics that are introduced in the first year. So as is the case with most disciplines, uh, students in communication have the opportunity to sort of tailor their learning through the later stages of the program by selecting courses that capture their interest more than more than others. So courses at this level, the, which I'm, I'm like uh, the upper division, third and fourth year, they tend to speak more to contemporary topics and they they often inflect uh, the research interests of faculty members themselves. Um, and as a as a quick aside, I've been part of a couple of communication departments here in Canada, and I have to say that the faculty here at Carleton are really are second to none in terms of not only the breadth of their research, but also the quality of it. So uh, a little plug there for my for my colleagues. Um, now, OK, so in terms of in terms of extracurricular activities, uh, aside from all of the student clubs and interest groups and organizations that are available at the university level, I think there was a question about that on the in the um, discussion thread. Um, the, commu the communication department really has a vibrant and active student society. Um, the Communication Undergraduate Student Society, or CUSS, is the acronym, C-O-S-S, -S, um, plays an important role in getting first-year students acquainted with the program and with the university. Um, throughout the school year, they'll organize a series of events, activities, and workshops that are not only designed for leisure and socialization, but also for student learning and professionalization. For instance, last year they invited a couple of communication professionals to speak to students about what it is they do and uh, and how, how it was that they were trained. So my suggestion for any incoming student would definitely be to get involved with CUSS and whether that means becoming a representative or just kind of keeping up to date with what they're up to, um, that would be, and that's an excellent and strategic move, I'd say. Uh, lastly, in terms of work opportunities, I think Andre uh, Dean Plurd covered this quite well, um, but I will say uh, that co-op is available through, throughout our program uh, or through our program. To be honest, I wish I was more um, well versed in how it works than, than I am, but I can tell you that Dr. Knezevich, and uh, she's online, and so if you have any questions, um, I'd invite you to ask during the Q&A. Um, but what I can tell you about the co-op program, however, is that in my classes, I've had more than a few students who've participated in it and they have nothing but good things to say about their experiences. Um, our students tend to find placements uh, in a number of different fields, as the employer had mentioned, uh, and across a range of positions as political advisors for government, as communication strategists in the private sector or working for an NGO and in the media industry. So I think that uh, that should probably do it in terms of my overview of the first year courses and the program in general. And so I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. And um, if not, I can describe maybe the uh, the intro courses in just a bit more detail if uh, if that would be useful. Well, Vincent, there, there was a question about um, whether the course is available for for students who are studying uh, in journalism. Um, so maybe you could touch a little bit on uh, kind of the School of Journalism and Communication, and we, we will touch or talk to uh, Randy from Journalism and Chris from Media Production and Design, but maybe you can talk a bit about, um, you know, kind of how communication fits into the school itself and, uh, and whether or not some of the courses are available for students outside of communications and media studies. Mm -hmm. So um, the degree the degree is, is largely a sort of, uh, it's theoretically oriented. It's theoretically oriented in the sense that our aim in the department is to get students to learn how to think, um, learn how to think and be reflexive and gain what you know what we call media literacy. Uh, we have some hands-on sorts of approaches that are at the upper division, but it's largely um, they're they're uh, you know a handful of fourth-year courses that kind of get students working with media and, and producing media. But a large part of it is, uh, I think, as uh, Dr. Knezevich mentioned in the uh, in the chat thread, uh, sort of uh, critical and uh, theoretical. Um, in terms of students, uh, students sitting in my class, I know that there are three sections of the intro course, comms uh, 1001 and 1002, the two courses that I teach. Um, and the, the sections that I teach are dedicated to uh, comms majors only. 
There is, however, a third section, uh, section C, that runs in each semester that's open to journalism uh, journalism majors as well. So there is some uh, some play between the, the programs, um, and that would be kind of how, how journalism students end up sitting in the first year um, the first year comms classes. Awesome, and I got a couple of uh, not questions, but statements. So one student said that they're coming for comms, comms and media studies and they can't wait. And another student mentioned that he didn't have a question, but he wanted to say how uh, excited they are to be coming into communications and media studies and how the courses sound really great. And they love hearing about them. So just want to throw some positive feedback uh, your way. And, and to say again, I, I'm a graduate of this degree, so I, I'm a little biased, but I think it's the greatest degree ever created. Um, maybe you can talk a bit about the enthusiasm you see from students as they kind of enter into their first year and, and the types of, of connections that come out of that, um, that, that, um, that bond that they mm -hmm. get uh, with the degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stanley. Uh, well, the first thing I'll say is uh, we're excited to have you. Um, we're really looking forward to having to income, uh, welcoming the incoming cohort this year. Um, in terms of the enthusiasm students have, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I saw it in, in last year's cohort quite a bit. Uh, when you cover, as, as an instructor, when I cover topics that, um, that students connect with because it's part of their everyday life, it, I think the, the connections are there to be made. You know, when we talk about social media in class, when we talk about um, you know, cancel culture. When, when you know, I work through a given topic, whatever the topic might be, using um, using examples that resonate in students' lives, using contemporary things, things that happened literally yesterday, uh, that I draw on and bring them into class. You know, the 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 effort that I have to put into making it to connect with students with students' lives, everyday lives, is minimal because it's there and. You know, communication and using media, these are things that we're doing always and already. Um, so thinking about them from a critical perspective and, and trying to develop, as I say, uh, you know, media literacy, it's, it seems like a natural, it seems like a natural step. And I saw it in last year's cohort. Um, students were really, really excited. I would get students talking to me after every lecture about how and why a given topic resonates with them. And so um, I'm ex we're excited to have you. Awesome. We'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Vincent. Uh, if you have any more questions for uh, communications and media studies, you can definitely uh, fire up those questions uh, in the Q&A. Uh, next Stanley. person you're going to hear from is uh, Chris Gunn, and uh, he's going to chat a bit about our uh, Bachelor of Economics. So Chris, uh, you're up. Okay, thank you very much, Stanley. Um, and I, I'll just start by saying you did mention that communications was perhaps the best degree created. I will politely um, argue during this period that economics might take that place, but I would be lovely. It would be lovely to relinquish a second place. Um, but welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Gunn. Um, I'm an associate professor and uh, undergraduate supervisor in the Department of Economics. Um, I I'm a macroeconomist, so I teach uh, intermediate macro theory, advanced macro theory at the undergraduate level, and then I do a, a PhD course in uh, macro and monetary theory. Uh, what I want to talk about in the next few minutes um, is, of course, giving an overview of our Bachelor of Economics undergraduate program. Um, and I'd like to talk about an exciting new addition we added to that program um, that will be in place for next year. Before I do that, though, I just want to say a few things about economics in general, because unlike some of the other disciplines in the fact that I find when I speak with high school students, there could be um, a, a bit of a misunderstanding about what economics actually is. Um, and, and when I you know, meet with students, they often will come to me and, and say, what exactly is economics? And, and in particular, how does economics differ from business? I, I typically hear that by, from about 90% of students. So let's start off right there um, and think about what is the difference between studying in business and economics? I know many of you are thinking about that struggle right now. Um, th these degrees can overlap. The disciplines can overlap. They're both really great degrees, but they're fundamentally quite different in, the, in their approach. Um, in a nutshell, in business, you're learning about how to create and, and operate and manage a business and finance a business. And it's really focused about these administrative aspects of how to run and operate a business. Um, in contrast, economics, is, it's a social science and you're learning a framework for trying to study and analyze decisions or choices made by households and government and businesses. And so there can be you know, an overlap in terms of some of the domain, but fundamentally it's, a, it's an intellectual type um, science. 
Um, and so what we really like to stress when we think about this is these decision makers making um, trying to you know, make choices when they're trying to face uncertainty and when they're facing competing interests and when they're facing limited resources. OK, um, and that, you know, we think develops some a really nice aspect of thinking about this scientific approach. Um, and that is what the second thing I want to stress is that fundamentally it's a science um, and uh, the, the primary component of that is that in a pursuit of these questions, we're typically developing theories and forming quantitative models, but then we're always using evidence and data to try to sort through those things. So it's this interplay between these uh, these two modes of thought and we're using you know, data and projections to try to predict and understand this behavior from uh, particular economic actors. And so why do we study all this? Well, um, for one, it's really interesting, but for two, we can actually help society a lot. So and different aspects of society so we can deal with important um, societal questions right? and we can deal with important problems for the government, but we also can deal with a lot of problems and state problems related to individuals and households and uh, um, and businesses themselves. OK, so, so many of you might know that uh, economists study things like uh, business cycles, monetary policy, international trade, inflation, unemployment. Those are the things you often read about uh, when you you know you open the Globe and Mail and look in the business section or just look at see the general pages. But that's only a small fraction of economics, and there's a lot of uh, economists, including in our faculty, working on things that typically people would think are part of other fields, things like healthcare, climate change, and the environment. Uh, these are all really, really important societal issues that benefit from having this social scientific type approach and, and the framework that we're bringing to the table, um, not just as advocates, but really an objective science trying to think about these questions. Uh, we also have economists dealing with things like social structures related to family and marriage. Believe it or not, economists even will talk about marriage markets. Um, so we can, if, if, if there's an object, we can usually create a market for it. Okay. Um, so our Bachelor of Economics degree, it was up, up to about three or four years ago, it was a Bachelor of Arts degree, and then we migrated it into a, a very specific Bachelor of Economics degree to try to, I think, improve the optics in terms of what we're actually doing within the degree. And that's, by and large, the students have found that um, really beneficial type change. Um, so the, the core emphasis is on, on you know, educating in this framework, framework of thought, and uh, through these strands of developing skills in economic theory and quantitative and statistical analysis. Now, there certainly is a, a large focus on the quantitative aspects, but that doesn't mean that's the only path. So we, we've built in enough flexibility into the degree, into the degree where you have choices, um, and you can effectively choose your path once you get to a certain point. Right? So, for example, a, you know, a traditional student wanting a quantitative bent could make their choices such that they're getting a lot of quantitative skills coming out of the degree, and they may find themselves in, you know, further economic studies in graduate school. Um, they could find themselves in analytical roles within the government or within the financial sector. These are, you know, two very large. Um, sectors that employ our graduates. High technology is 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 also very uh, large, and it's increasingly becoming so with the reliance on on data science. Okay, and then many other sectors, traditional and non-traditional. Okay, others might choose a, a, a less quantitative path, um, where they develop some of the initial foundation courses around economic thought. But then we find that that can provide a really nice springboard into some of the less quantitative um, areas, like for example. Um, uh, inter, uh, international relations, uh, uh, journalism, or uh, uh, law, for example. We have a fair number of, of uh, students going into those those type paths. Okay. Um, within the degree itself, you have the option of doing up to eight different concentrations, which are just specializations in particular areas of economics. In some cases, you're taking courses to fulfill these concentrations from across the university. So examples are financial economics, which is by and large our most popular concentration. Often students who are also have an interest in business and see themselves working in the financial sector will take this. Um, and then as part of this concentration, the students end up taking several courses out of the Sprott School of Business uh, in the in the uh, within the university and other we have development is another option uh, we have options in uh, computational analysis where students take several computer science courses as part of this uh, this year we're very happy to announce um, a new concentration that will be available for students uh, in the fall and that's in economic data science 
Um, and as m many of you know, the field of data science is, has become extremely popular and extremely high demand and um, quite an excellent uh, a garden for placing students at, at different levels. Um, and we've developed, you know, as we've developed a lot of technologies in society to gather these masses of amounts of data and store them and process them and collect data in non-traditional forms, it's opened up this many, many new opportunities in which, you know, in this data analytics that in effect has existed for a really long time. Okay. Um, data scientists you can find will come from many different in disciplines. At Carleton, we have great programs and different aspects of data science across the university through computer science or statistics. Uh, we think though economics, economics in general, and then our program specifically um, is, is able to capitalize on some really unique aspects. Um, we look at problems in a very different way, in a very unique way by trying to motivate our, our analysis through economic theory. Um, and through the years of all the empirical analysis and the way these methods have developed in economics, we've developed many uh, statistical methods, which we refer to as econometrics, that uh, lend themselves very, very well to these data, um, data science um, type problems. So we've been, you know, when I meet with employers and I meet with past graduates, they say how much they enjoy and benefit from being able to hire economists working in these data science capacities in contrast to someone who's purely technical or someone who just has computer programming skills or even someone who just has mathematical scientific skills, skills because there's a, a huge value to the business to be able to apply this economic reasoning. So we're very excited about this, um, this option and we think it'll give students a, you know, not only fulfill some of their intellectual curiosity, but provide some more avenues into to different placements. Um, the, the, the data science concentration itself um, begins by the students taking some initial courses in computer coding and information technology, but that's not the focus. The focus of the overall degree would be trying to view these database problems through the lens of economics theory and uh, and developing the quantitative tools to support that. Um, and it will culminate in, in these two new courses we've added at the third and fourth year level where students will be working with uh, practicing data scientists in the industry in Ottawa and the high tech sector who will be uh, contribute to some of the teaching content and have the students actually uh, participate in, in, in practical projects, um, putting their material up into GitHub, etc. Okay, um, so that's all I'd like to say right now as part of this, the, uh, the formal introduction. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions later and of course um, I, I can address additional specifics during the uh, the freeform discussion that follows. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. I just want to ask you one quick question about, uh, there was a question about um, applications and whether or not the applications that are going to be utilized throughout the degree are iOS Windows friendly. So if you're using an Apple uh, device or uh, a Windows application, will you be fine? Yeah, that I, that I, I think students will be fine on all platforms. We even have some students who hardcore that uh, only work on say Linux. Um, but if you know, and if I look across my faculty meetings, usually I you see half half iOS devices and half, uh, uh, you know, Windows based devices. Uh, so, so for the most part, we're not dependent on that particular technology. When you get into quantitative courses, um, for example, if you do an introduction in econometrics uh, later, and there may be a specific software package that the professor is asking you to use, um, typically we're using, you know, broad based, highly regarded packages like R or Stata, and these tend to be available across pa uh, platform. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Chris. And again, if there are any questions about uh, the economics degree, uh, please feel free to uh, ask Chris in the uh, Q and A. Um, thank our you, next degree. Oh, go ahead. So, so I was going to say, Stanley, did I did I change your ranking on the best degree ever yet? After that? Well, you know, you know, my 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 vote is not for sale. So um, <laughs> I've already been uh, converted fully to communications by. I truly do value every single degree that we're going to hear from today, for sure. Uh -huh. Thank you, Stanley, and thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you. All right, so you're you're seeing Neil on the screen currently. Uh, so uh, Neil is going to talk a bit more about the Bachelor of Global and International Studies. Go ahead, Neil. Thanks, Stanley. Uh, I'm going to have to disagree with my colleagues Vince and Chris and assert that Global and International Studies is sort of central right now, at least in this, these particular times, but I guess that's up to students to uh, decide. Um, I want to give a quick overview of the program, its elements, talk a little bit about the first year experience and take any questions that students may have. Uh, this program is designed to train students in how to make sense of global and international issues and processes through intensive interdisciplinary study. 
uh, as well as experiential learning that requires students to go overseas and put into practice what they've learned. Uh, our goal is to train deep critical thinkers who are also prepared for a career in the international field and are also prepared for graduate studies around the world. Uh, in the program, you'll find four main elements. Uh, first, there are a set of core courses that all of our students must take together. Uh, and these uh, give you a kind of interdisciplinary background in global and international studies. So for example, in first year, your core courses would include global history, global law and politics, and global ethnography and culture. Uh, in second year, they'd be global ethics, international economic systems, and global literatures. Third year, international theory and global environment. And in fourth year, you would choose from one from a range of seminars on special topics. So I, I mentioned these just to give you a sense of the, the interdisciplinarity of this program. Uh, in addition to taking a set of core courses, you would take you would choose one from 18 specializations. Seems like a lot of specializations, but uh, what this lets you do is tailor the program to your specific interests. Uh, so if you're interested in a particular issue like migration, uh, you can specialize in migration studies. If you're interested in a particular region such as Eastern Europe, you can specialize in Europe and Russia in the world. Uh, if you're interested in a career in the political field, you can take global politics or global law and social justice, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you choose one specialization and you choose that when you first come into the program. You can certainly change it if you find that it's not meeting your needs as you go through the program. Uh, third element of the program is the international experience requirement. And here we have a number of options. All students are required to uh, go abroad if possible uh, and experience the world more broadly. So uh, one option is work placements uh, uh, where we would place you in an organization in some other part of the world and you'd become part of the, the team there. Um, examples of places where our students have gone include Canadian delegation to the United Nations, uh, children's sports camp in Uganda, a women's entrepreneurship organization in Vietnam, uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels, an alternative energy organization in Uganda, the House of Lords and House of Commons in the UK, and a number of governments around the world as well. A uh, second kind of option is Carleton courses taught abroad, um, where a professor takes the course overseas. And these include uh, places where students have gone, classes have gone include, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, um, Germany to study uh, uh, immigration into the EU, uh, social movements in Havana, um, religious diversity in Israel, and many other places as well. Uh, we also have university exchanges, of course, with, and Carleton has agreements with over 175 universities around the world. And we have an e-volunteering course also. Uh, this is a course where students work through Skype from here in Ottawa with local groups overseas on development projects. So uh, if you want to ask me more questions about that, please feel free. And we, we do have uh, provisions in place uh, right now when we are all locked down for uh, because of the pandemic. So please uh, ask questions about that. Um, there's also a, a language requirement, the fourth element of the program, two credits of language courses taken in your first and second year. It can be a language of your choice, any language that Carleton offers, including American Sign Language, if you wish. Uh, we feel that that's an important part of being a global person and an analyst of international affairs. Uh, so in terms of the first year experience, um, one of the good things about this program, I think, is that unlike a lot of other units, uh, our courses, our first year courses have around 100 students in them, uh, which get, allows you to get to know these students. Uh, and you're going through your core courses with the same students throughout. So um, you do get to form a fairly cohesive cohort over time. We have a very active student society. Um, that organizes a number of events throughout the year, including uh, first year social, uh, exam de-stressor, coffee houses, 
uh, embassy tours around Ottawa, um, networking nights with Ottawa-based professionals, an annual charity gala, and a number of other kinds of events. Uh, in terms of what your first year would look like in this program, um, you'd take uh, three core courses in uh, the GINs, Global History, International Law and Politics, Ethnography, Globalization and Culture. Uh, then you would take two introductory level courses in a language of your course, of your choice rather, uh, two introductory courses in your area of specialization. So let's say you chose international uh, global law and social justice, then you'd take laws 1001 and 1002, and that would leave you with three electives to take whatever you wanted. So um, overall, that's the program in a nutshell, and I'm happy to take any questions that people may have. Uh, yeah, we actually have two questions uh, that we want to uh, maybe you can answer. The first one was about uh, the international component. So uh, the students kind of uh, mentioned that they they recognize everything that's happening obviously globally this year, but they're looking forward to year three and they're, they're wondering where have students gone? So what are some of the places students have gone through uh, the Global and International Studies program? Right, so um, basically they've been to every continent except Antarctica so far. Uh, but um, a lot of uh, uh, students have gone to various African countries working on uh, development projects, um, Uganda, um, uh, Ethiopia, South Africa, Senegal are ones that come immediately to mind. Uh, students have been to various places in Europe as well, um, Spain, uh, working for international organizations, um, Germany, uh, people have worked for the governments of Malta, Russia, Sweden, Fiji, China, Kosovo, um, the ones that come to mind, once again, off the top of my head. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of our students have gone to Central and South America as well to work on development projects in various countries there. So basically anywhere you want to go, we can basically set it up for you. Perfect. And the next question was about the specialization. So I think there are 18 specializations within the program. That's um, right. Do students have the ability to change specializations if they become interested in a different area? Yes, they do. Uh, we have staff available. Our advisors are there to help you make any kinds of changes you want. And it's not uncommon to do so. So uh, we're well versed in how to make that happen. So students can certainly uh, change their specializations. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Neil. And uh, again, Neil will be available uh, in the chat or in the Q&A to answer uh, many more of your questions related to the Bachelor of Global and International Studies. Um, the next person you're going to see on screen is uh, Randy Boswell. He is a member of our uh, Bachelor of Journalism, Journalism Department, and uh, he's going to tell you more about uh, journalism at Carleton. So, Randy, how are you? I'm good. Can you hear me fine? Yes, I can. OK, good. Um, yeah, my name is Randy Boswell. I was a longtime practicing journalist, a newspaper reporter for many years, and I've been teaching at the school for the last, uh, well, 25 or so, I guess. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, sort of five key points I want to get across, and then I'm happy to answer as many questions as you have. Uh, one is that I want to make sure that my little signs are reaching you. Uh, okay. There you go. We can see it there. Yep. OK, <laughs> this, this one says we're ready to teach. Um, the point I want to make here is that, uh, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic didn't uh, stop us from uh, completing our winter courses in March and April, and we would be ready to teach tomorrow in an all online world. Um, even so, we're working hard to um, improve and ready our technology uh, in order to be as engaging and um, uh, interesting as possible in the fall. I um, uh, just want to say we have highly experienced and effective faculty, top-notch contract instructors from the uh, world of journalism and communication, um, all accomplished communicators by profession, um, so we have state-of-the-art art technology across all media and platforms, uh, video, audio, digital text, and photo, um, uh, and we're getting that ready for the fall. 
Uh, ultimately, learning how to do journalism actually doesn't take a ton of technology. Uh, I think you've got one of these probably. It's a smartphone. Um, you've probably got one of these. It's a laptop computer. You probably got one of these, a pad and paper um, uh, uh, and, and a pen. Um, that's a lot of what you need uh, to start learning to become a journalist. So um, uh, it's not that complicated. Uh, second point I want to make. Our yeah, graduates that. succeed. Um, uh, they learn how to create content delivered effectively to audiences every possible way from traditional channels to social media, from print to podcasts. The best measure of our success as a university program is the success of our graduates. Um, turn on your radio and our graduates are delivering the latest news and hosting local, regional and national programs. Turn on your TV and our alumni are reporting from across Canada and around the world, working as writers and producers behind the scenes, interviewing premiers and prime ministers about the COVID crisis. Um, they're everywhere. Um, interviewing business leaders and sports stars, celebrities and ordinary people. Uh, open a newspaper or a digital news site. Uh, our graduates are there as well, covering major events and issues, editing prominent publications, building and engaging with audiences around the globe. Uh, and J School graduates succeed in many fields beyond journalism, from public relations and public policy to education and entrepreneurship. Next. We offer a journalism plus advantage. A lot of the programs at Carleton do in the sense that you combine your discipline with other fields of specialization. And um, we were Canada's first journalism school. Uh, we're Canada's best known journalism school. Uh, and this year we're actually celebrating our 75th anniversary. Um, you can still see me there? Okay, good, I was frozen for a second. Um, from the very beginning, our philosophy has been that you should not only be trained in the fundamentals of journalism, uh, but also in a range of other subjects with a specialization in particular in one. Um, we believe in graduating well-rounded students uh, and we know that they benefit from this long-standing approach. Uh, the specialization can take the form of a minor or a major and I can get into that uh, through questions. Next important message. We're a relatively small program with relatively small classes. Even our first year classes, uh, which uh, all of the incoming students attend together, uh, whether in the lecture theater or online this fall, um, we'll number just over 100. Um, and in the years that follow, uh, our hands-on roll up your sleeves workshop classes uh, where students learn the tools of the trade, often work on actual news sites reaching real world audiences, typically gather about 20 students at a time, a little bit more sometimes. So you get to know your instructors on a first name basis. Um, you learn from us in more formal classroom settings, but you also learn that it's OK to swing by my office, shoot the breeze about what's happening in the world of journalism or the world in general, um, and whether or not the Senators or the Leafs are likely to make the Stanley Cup playoffs, that kind of thing. Um, our students are also experts at creating a sense of community at the J School. So we have a journalism society that um, gathers students together for social events, for mentoring, for networking in the career, etc. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just want an example of the kind of community cohesion that we have. You know, when this whole pandemic unfolded, um, you know, one of the things that the School of Journalism did was hustle to try and arrange some funding so that a number of our students, a good number of our students, could actually work this summer 
um, on the uh, on the flagship publication of the School of Journalism. So we're in the process right now of hiring about 20 students who are going to be, um, uh, you know, uh, producing journalism over this summer um, and, and having it published on our school um, uh, publication called Capital Current. Check it out. And finally, um, this is really reinforcing some messages that uh, Andre and others have uh, already articulated. Um, but this says, if I can get it right, Carleton's campus and Canada's capital are awesome. Um, you may not be coming to Carleton physically in September, uh, but you'll be getting here eventually. Uh, it's a beautiful campus set off from the busier parts of the city, surrounded by water and green spaces. Um, uh, and Ottawa itself, for those of you who don't already live here, is a, uh, is a fairly small city easy to get around um, and we have enormous advantages as capitals as Canada capital um, which are especially attractive if you're here to study journalism our students get to observe and report on the workings of Parliament and the Supreme Court I think as uh, Andre mentioned earlier the Dean um, we can visit and produce stories about what's happening in a whole range of national museums galleries national research institutes and apart from all that, this is a cool city in terms of its mix of vibrant communities, businesses, the arts, recreation and nature. Um, between Carlton's campus and Canada's capital, uh, this is a really great place to spend four years of your life. Ask away if you have any questions. Yeah, I love that message, uh, Randy. And, and one of the things that I noticed when we were um, kind of at the beginning of this pandemic was uh, some of the, the work that your students were able to do uh, related to COVID-19. I know there was an article written about the impacts of uh, COVID on religious organizations and, and churches as they converted to the kind of um, online uh, virtual spaces. So maybe one of these you could uh, again mention is uh, the idea of the skills and how transferable these skills that our students are getting um, are to not only um, the journalism world, but to other avenues as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, one of the things that we emphasize is that we're, um, you know, we're educating, um, you know, future journalists, but the skills that you get here are, uh, you know, across a broad range of technologies. And it's also conceptual too. You learn how to tell a story. You learn how to observe and gather information in the world. These are skills that are uh, of value um, outside the traditional news business um, that many of us uh, uh, you know, were employed in for many years, um, many centuries. Uh, it, it's actually, uh, you know, a, a good skill set for um, a number of uh, government jobs at various levels in terms of research and communication. Uh, Non-government organizations, uh, there are lots of our graduates who end up doing advocacy work um, on environmental issues or social issues. Um, uh, there are um, uh, any number of fields in terms of, uh, you know, public policy research um, uh, and so forth, where our, our students, um, you know, take the skills that they've learned in journalism and apply them elsewhere. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Randy. And again, folks, if you have any questions about our Bachelor of Journalism, Randy is available to answer uh, those questions through our Q&A. Um, I should also remind you, if you are just tuning in, um, thank you for, for checking us out. We are spotlighting our Faculty of Public Affairs. And the next program you're gonna hear from is um, the, the newest program or degree to, uh, to join the Public Affairs family, uh, the Bachelor of Media Production and Design. And you're gonna hear from Chris Waddell, who is not only a, a really great member of our community, but also a longtime Toronto Maple Leafs fan. So uh, Chris, uh, thank you for that long time support and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say about the program itself. So if you wanna press the unmute button and uh, the floor will be yours. Thanks, Stanley. I was going to remind you that I was actually alive when the Leafs last won the Stanley Cup, but um, but um, there you go. Uh, yes, thanks very much. I'm Chris Waddell. I'm the um, director of the Media Production and Design Program. It is, as Stanley noted, uh, a new program at, at Carleton. We're just starting our third year, 
and it's going to be a really exciting year for uh, for a couple of reasons I'll tell you about in, in, in a minute or two. Uh, we operate within the School of Journalism and Communication, and the program is designed for people who are interested in, in acquiring both the editorial side and also some of the programming and design side to produce online uh, online info packages of online information. So that could be uh, almost anything you could do online that might show up on a computer screen, might show up on a website, might show up on a, a mobile device. Uh, and it could be for almost anyone, for um, for um, corporations, for in the healthcare sector, for people who are doing anything in the way of uh, of uh, government uh, government relations as well, government departments, educational institutions, uh, almost anybody, uh, new media companies and news organizations that want to put thing on, things online. Um, we, in the course of the four years, you you take twelve credits that are compulsory, uh, and you've got eight credits of uh, things you can choose you that you want to do. Some of our students are doing a minor at our business school, uh, the minor in entrepreneurship at the Sprott School of Business. We also have a fair number of students who are taking a minor in film studies as well. That seems fairly popular with our students. Um, but during the four years, you take um, some courses with that are just designed for media production and design students. You take some courses when you're uh, taught by the School of Information Technology and you're in with the information technology students and you take some courses with journalism students. So you're in with journalism students uh, in first year. You do um, you do um, a couple of courses with information and technology, a course on introduction to web development. Uh, another course on inter introduction to interactive multimedia design, and then an introduction to programming. Whereas the the um, um, media production design courses you take are one on uh, introduction to storytelling in the fall term, and then in the winter term you get into the fall term is mostly about uh, about theory, and the winter term is more about practice where you get to actually do things. And um, we take in about 60 students a year um, to to uh, to get into the program. You need to have a uh, grade 12 English and also grade 12 math. It can be advanced functions, calculus or data management. Uh, at the moment, we have 29 people who are coming this fall. Uh, we um, who've indicated already they're coming and it's just where we were last year at this point too in our recruiting site. So, so we're right on pace to where we were last year. Our first year class is um, generally made up of, of uh, mostly grade 12 students, but we found a lot of interest students transferring from other programs into the program. So the last two years we've had about 10 or 11 students transferred from other degree programs into the program because it's a new program. And we also have quite a few international students as well, up to 12, 14, 15 of them. Um, that's been our experience the last couple of years anyway, so we'll see what happens this year. Um, I said this was going to be a particularly interesting and exciting year for us because um, because of several things. Our third year students, students who came to Carleton uh, in the fall of, of uh, 2018, uh, of the class of about 25 or 26 of them, eight of them are going out on a co-op placement in January. That's our first co-op placement. Um, they'll be off for a year uh, working with various uh, organizations, uh, media companies, uh, production houses who may actually do uh, do uh, produce online packages of information for anybody who, who might need it. Um, maybe working with uh, with communications companies, uh, museums. Um, the Parliament of Canada is interested in taking some of our students as well. And as I think might be the um, the interactive multimedia studio that the architecture department at Carleton actually runs. So um, having our first students go out on on um, placements is great, and the co-op office will. Um, will find placements for you or if you are interested in a placement back home wherever you're from we can work uh, we can work with uh, whoever that might be back wherever you uh, you're from if you're outside Ottawa to find a placement for you for if you get to if you want to take co-op in third year the other reason that's interesting is that the last two years our students have been working um, a fair amount of time out with organizations in the Ottawa area and and this year now for the first time our second year class has produced a lot of material that's available online. I'll post it. I'll post the link um, on the Q&A site so you can have a look if you're interested. Uh, they were working with the National Arts Centre this year and the National Arts Centre is the big um, theater and music uh, music uh, Hall um, in Ottawa it was built um, as a centennial project in 1967. Actually, it was finished in 1970, so it's having its 50th year this year. And uh, and what our students did work in in the winter term, they worked with the NAC to produce a whole bunch of online packages of information that are highlighting some of the art that's at the NAC. So that's the various projects they've done. Some are audio, some are visual, some are um, some are uh, mostly writing. Uh, in the program, you take all those things. You do video, you do uh, photography, you do audio, 
Uh, you work with uh, 360 cameras. We're also starting into uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. And then you're also doing some of the, um, the work on the design side as well. Our first year students, though, for the past two years, they've worked with the Museum of Nature in Ottawa to work on, on developing ideas for how you can take some of the exhibits that are at the Museum of Nature and turn them into online exhibits. So you can give people who can't get to Ottawa um, an opportunity to have some of the experiences that you would actually have if you were in the museum and touring some of the exhibits at the museum. So I'll post the second year students uh, work on there on the um, on the uh, Q&A side as soon as I finish speaking. Um, and I guess I'll just finish up by saying a couple of, of, of other things. Um, when students that come into the program uh, in June, we send out a letter to everyone that will welcome you all and and we'll also give you some indication of, uh, of the technology that you might want to have in order to come participate in the program. But for more of the, com the more complicated things you're doing on the programming and information technology side, our School of Information Technology has large computer labs and we have all the uh, have all the specialized programming that you actually need to do some of that work so you can do the work in the lab. But there's a fair amount of uh, things you can do um, at home as well. Um, we also and um, and then in September, we of course run an orientation where we talk about uh, a little bit about what you're going to see in the year ahead. And we'll also have an opportunity to speak to some of our first and our, our second and third year students to you can get some of their impressions about what the program was actually like. So um, the one last thing I should say is that um, although we want to take in about 60 students a year, um, we split that into much smaller groups in a lot of cases. Um, for instance, in both first year and second year, um, you do the introduction to storytelling uh, uh, course in first year where everyone's together in the fall term and in the winter term we're split up into smaller workshops where the workshop classes are only about 30 students maximum. Uh, our visual story uh, introduction to um, visual communication in second year workshops of 30 classes too. So in some cases you're working with small groups of students, um, but you do have a few larger courses and you take students uh, courses with a journalism class uh, on uh, media law and uh, take some upper year courses with some journalism students on freelancing and on the state of the media and some of those issues as well and, and an ethics course you're taking with journalism students too. So by the time you finish the four years, you've got the skills to do both the editorial side and some of the programming and design side for online presentations and also um, had a chance to do something else as well if there's another area interested uh, that interests you. So that's probably as good as anything for the moment, Stanley. Happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Yeah, there are there are two questions I want you to touch on uh, if, if sure. you can. Um, one was just asking about the difference between uh, media production design and communication and media studies. So if, if you had like a like a one liner, what would be that like, um, I guess that, that, that key kind of a difference that uh, you would highlight? I, I think the key difference would be um, we're a lot smaller program for one thing because we're starting out, uh, but we're also much more of a hands on program and you're doing sort of things. You're producing material all the way through, right? Starting from first year, uh, you're learning things in the classroom, but you're also getting opportunities to apply apply them and turn them uh, out into projects and that we're out working in the uh, in the um, in the field with uh, with various organizations around the city and across the country as well. Um, communications and media studies is more more. It, I would say a little more of a traditional academic program. I think one of the answers earlier was that there is some of the hands on material in the in the upper years, but but it's much, um, much more intensive hands on, I would say, in media production and design. And then that answer kind of feeds into our next question, which is about the programming side of BMPD. So this dude mm -hmm. talked about the digital storytelling and photography, but not being as yes. interested uh, in the programming side. So how much of the program is programming focused? Um, the programming focus is in the first, really in the first couple of years. Um, you have courses in first year. If you go on the website, I can give you the link to that too. You can see a course, a course, uh, a program map that shows you what courses you're taking in each year. And it also shows you um, where, who you're taking them with. So for instance, you every year you do about two and a half to three credits in the program, which are the compulsory courses you need. In first and second year, um, about you know, about two credits in, in first year and one credit in second year and then a half after that. So the programming part um, that's compulsory declines as you get into the upper years of the program. But in the first year you're in uh, programming courses with students who are in a several um, inter, uh, um, information technology course programs, which is interactive multimedia design, networking, pro, um, photonics, just the basic courses there. So. But you also will have the option in upper years to take more some of those as, elective, as electives if you want to do that too. Perfect. 
Thank you so much, Chris. And, and thank you all for those questions. And please keep those questions coming. Chris will be online to answer them through the Q&A. Um, and I'll post the link to our second year students work right now. Perfect, thank you. So our next degree program is the Bachelor of Public Affairs and Policy Management. And I'd like to ask Lisa to uh, tell us a bit more about uh, that program. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for watching today. Oh, and yes, my mic is unmuted. You are perfect. Yeah, good. I'm getting a message to unmute my mic, but it is unmuted. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for being here today. I'm Lisa Mills. I'm the director of the Public Affairs and Policy Management Program. And I want to say, first of all, that I cannot think of a better time to be studying public policy than right now. Uh, what is happening right now is that every day there are public policy decisions being made. So there are decisions being made about what can open and what has to remain closed. Uh, there are decisions about how much support to provide to students over the next couple of months. Um, there's decisions about which businesses should receive financial support in the form of loans or grants. Um, there were decisions about the emergency benefits payments. Every day, there are critical public policy decisions being made about how to deal with this pandemic. And these um, public policy decisions are being made in the present um, to deal with the absolutely critical situation we're facing. But in the next few years, we're going to need to think about, OK, even broader and more structural kinds of changes uh, to deal with the, the fallout from, um, from COVID. So our degree uh, is really designed to prepare you to contribute to the debates and the policies and the decisions that are, are going to be made um, in the next few years and for the rest of your lives about how to deal with this very changed world that we have. Uh, in fact, um, one of our alumni, Joe Cressy, is actually very involved with this right now. He's the chair of the Toronto Bo Board of Public Health. So every day right now, one of our graduates is making decisions about how to deal with the effects of COVID in Toronto. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about the degree itself, um, it's a limited enrollment degree program. What that means is that it's small. OK, so we had 80 students who were enrolled last year. And um, so we hope we um, aim for a number of less than 100 to uh, join our program. This means that you have the experience of being with a small cohort and you get to go through um, the central part, the foundational part of the program with that cohort. And that cohort are usually uh, students who are fantastic students who are very keen, who are very keen on public policy, really committed, um, interesting, wonderful young people. Now, what the what the program does is we aim to give you a uh, an in depth examination of public policy. Uh, so there's a core series of courses about public policy issues, um, and then we also have uh, an interdisciplinary um, interdisciplinary courses in history, in economics, in law and legal studies, in politics, in public administration. And those courses actually give you a broader understanding of the context in which policy takes place and give you an understanding of some of the, um, the techniques and the background that you no need to know about in order to contribute to to public policy. Um, after first year, so your first year, everyone goes through the first year together. And then after the first year, you have four specializations to choose from. Um, the first specialization is communications and technology policy. Another specialization is uh, international policy, international policy studies. Third specialization, development policy studies. And the fourth is public policy and administration. And that's to do with public policy, mainly within Canada. And so if you have a particular interest in policy in the international arena or in um, studying um, 
policies with regard to developing countries or poorer countries or disadvantaged communities within Canada, um, you would do development policy studies. If you are interested in um, in communication and technology policy, the implication of all the technologies that we're even more reliant on at the moment, then you would choose that specialization. If you're interested in aspects of Canadian policy, environmental policy in Canada, indigenous policy, um, social policy, housing, health, um, you would choose the public policy and administration specialization. Um, we also have a co-op program uh, so if you want to get experience in working in public policy, the co-op program is an excellent opportunity to do that. In terms of the kind of careers that people um, pick up after doing this degree, um, some people go directly into politics. They become city councillors, they become MPs. Other people work as policy analysts for government. Other people work for think tanks. Uh, so we have um, people who work for the Maytree Foundation or the Broadbent Institute doing research on policy. Um, and other people go on to law school or masters in public health, masters in public administration. So there are many um, interesting options to contribute to policy as a result of this degree. And um, it's working in policy is really important, especially at the moment. Uh, so I will leave it there in case there are any questions. Thank you for that, uh, Lisa. And I, I should mention uh, I'm the Carlton Page Liaison and a lot of our um, House of Commons pages uh, end up studying in the public affairs and policy management programs. So maybe you can uh, elaborate a bit more on uh, those connections to Parliament Hill and how that's used to really enhance the academic experience. Yeah, um, so we usually we usually have uh, one or two people every year who are pages in the House of Commons page program uh, who are also in the Papham program. So that means that um, there's a really tight connection between the kind of work they're doing on Parliament Hill, um, where they're assisting members of Parliament and getting to learn about the operation of Parliament. There's a really tight connection there between what they're doing and our and what they're learning in our degree. So the two things really reinforce each other very nicely. Um, because of our location in Ottawa, and now obviously things will be a little bit different this year because we're going to be learning online, but um, because of our location in Ottawa, what one of the things that we do is we go to Parliament and we hear from Parliament, we hear you know, from people working there in the building um, about how Parliament works. Um, we also go to the Supreme Court of Canada. We bring policy analysts and advisors working for government um, into the classroom to talk about the kind of work that they're doing. Uh, you have the opportunity to work um, on your co-op as um, a junior policy analyst or to work in a non-governmental organization um, like the United Nations Association of Canada or the World University Society of Canada. Um, so you have the opportunity to work, uh, gain experience in international fields as well as in Canadian public policy uh, through our degree. Awesome. Now there was a couple of questions about specialization, so we yes, can great. answer those before we let you go. Um, yes. The one question was about um, changing specializations. Can you change your specialization after your first year? And the other question was, if you are in a specialization, are you mm -hmm. still able to learn about other areas uh, that are not necessarily related to that specific um, uh, topic uh, within yes. your degree? Absolutely. So you choose your specialization in your second year, not your first. So your first year gives you an opportunity to um, learn some history, some economics, public policy, indigenous studies. And from that, hopefully you'll be able to say, OK, I know what specialization I want to go in. And you pick that in second year. But if in second year or even in third year you decide, you know what, this specialization really isn't for me, I should have done another one. No, no loss there, you can switch specializations. That, that is certainly possible. And um, while you're doing your specialization, um, you will also have the opportunity to do courses, particularly in your second year, you'll still be doing um, courses that 
are broader than your specialisation. So you will still be doing courses that are core to the public affairs and policy management program. And you would still be doing, say, um, courses in law and legal studies about the constitution, for example, which is pretty critical if you're working in public policy. Um, or you might do, um, you might do uh, continue with history courses or economics courses, depending on which specialization you're in. Um, so what we, we try and get a balance between depth and breadth in our program. So we try and give you depth in a bit of, in a specialization, but also breadth in terms of having an in what's called interdisciplinary experience, doing courses from different disciplines um, and courses that will give you context uh, for studying public policy. Awesome. And yeah. And was there another question there that I missed, Stanley? Uh, not for the moment, but there may be some more questions coming up. So uh, definitely uh, folks keep asking those questions uh, about public affairs and policy management to Lisa and she'll uh, definitely answer those questions in the Q&A. So thank you so much for that awesome update. And uh, the next program we're going to feature is thank our, you. thank you. Uh, is our Bachelor of uh, Social Work uh, with uh, Dennis. So Dennis, uh, the floor or the screen is yours. Great, um, th thank you everybody. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, thank you everybody for hanging in there uh, and participating. Um, I'm actually intrigued by many of the programs. I might go back to school eventually to get another <laughs> degree. Uh, so I'm here to talk about social work, uh, the Bachelor of Social Work program at the School of Social Work. Um, I'm a, a faculty member, associate professor with the school and also the uh, BSW program supervisor. So I kind of oversee the, the entire program. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of briefly talk a little bit about what social work is and kind of where our program kind of fits into that. Um, we're often referred to as the helping profession, um, but what that means and how we help people can, it, it can mean a broad, number of different things. Um, and so you might find social workers engage with a broad range of issues and populations, including some of our most vulnerable populations in our society, including children experiencing abuse, the homeless, low income, individuals with mental health or substance abuse problems, etc. You also find social workers working with these different issues and populations at different levels, um, working with them one on one at the individual level, working at the community level, or even at the policy levels. Uh, they do this in a number of different ways, including individual one-on-one -on -one counseling, doing policy work, being engaged in community development and practice, managing organizations or programs, conducting research, et cetera. Uh, many social workers work either in nonprofits, hospitals or clinics, social service or government agencies, Etc. Some even open their own practice, private practice. And I know colleagues who are working in the private sector, you know, either in human resources or things like that. Um, I think one thing about the Bachelor of Social Work, it's a professional degree that um, basically positions you to enter the social work profession. Um, so in the in the in the province of Ontario, a social work degree is required if you want to be called a social work, a social worker. And so our program trains you to become professional social workers. Um, as a profession, social workers are governed by a set of values. And so one of our key values is a commitment to social justice and equity. And so as we're helping people at an individual level or a community or policy level, you know, it's all within a framework of social justice and a commitment to creating social change. Our program currently has 366 students um, split across the four years. Our program is basically split between in, in halves. Uh, first half is kind of foundational where you're, you're taking more foundational courses um, to kind of provide you the theoretical, the practice foundations, and then the second half is kind of what we call our advanced program where you you begin to just kind of more specialized. So if you want to work with individuals specifically, you would be taking courses specifically on that. If there's um, it is also an opportunity to take courses um, doing social work with specific populations like uh, such as indigenous peoples, racialized communities, persons with disabilities, etc. In the third and fourth year also, 
one of the requirements is that you'll be doing a practicum each year. And so we have a requirement of two practicums that basically put you out in the field. And the purpose of those is really to kind of link the theory and the knowledge and the kind of the practice skills that you're learning in the class and really trying to um, apply them in the field. And um, hopefully the, the practicum plus the courses provide a mechanism for you to link theory with practice. Um, so our goal really as a program is to create an environment or space where you can develop your knowledge and skills academically, practically, as well as professionally. Um, our main goal is to prepare students to be competent, accountable social workers and advocates of progressive social change. And I think that's it. That's all I had. Um, yeah. I can open it up for questions. Yeah, actually, I had. I have one thing I want to, to add on there is um, it's something that we, we hear a lot about when we, we chat with um, with your department, uh, which is the structural approach. So maybe then you can talk a bit more about uh, what that structural approach represents uh, for our social work program and how does that make us kind of um, stand out from other uh, BSW programs across the country? Right. So one of the dominant frameworks in social work in Canada, as well as in the US, where I'm actually originally from, is this notion of person and environment. So even if we're working with in individual children or individuals um, dealing with grappling with mental health problems, um, as social workers, we, we have to take into account the environment that they come in, that they live, where they work, et cetera, because a number of different factors we believe, such as environmental factors, um, policy factors, et cetera, um, may have be factors and, and may influence kind of their behaviors or their or the challenges that they're facing. And so the structural approach is is structural theory, theory of social work is 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 a little more specific th in thinking that there are systemic kind of factors that really that all of us are kind of grappling with. Um, including policy uh, policy factors, including educational factors, including legislative factors, including environmental factors that really have a, a significant impact on our well-being and health. And so, and and we need to kind of understand that in order to really help people. Awesome, thank you for that. And there's a question here about uh, internships. So. Uh, the student asked that the BSW program has, or says that the program has a lot of good internships, and, and they were wondering mm -hmm. uh, when they'd be able to to go into the field. So I know you touched a bit about on that yeah. uh, in your update. Maybe talk a bit about what that looks like in terms of uh, the practicum in year three and year four. Right, and so those are the practicums that I was referring to in your third and fourth year, and um, you start really. So, for example, for if you're third, if you're doing a third year practicum, you really have to start thinking about and preparing in in the semester before that, in order and and our practicum staff and and faculty will help you um, link you to uh, various organizations. Um, part of the process is that you'll be doing an interview with the with the um, potential placement, uh, where obviously. They're trying to see if you're 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 ready to do the practicum there, as well as you want to see if it's a good fit for you as well as a student who wants who wants to learn about specific things. Um, the fourth year practicum is really so. The third year practicum is kind of a more generic, um, where you can kind of gain kind of general skills. The fourth year practicum is really where hopefully you'll be able to find a placement. And, and our, our fa staff and faculty will help you do that, a placement that really is 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 kind of in your interest area or 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 specific to what you want to learn and and kind of the skills and and experiences you want to gain as a student in your fourth year. And so um, that's kind of how. And and again, for the fourth year practicum, you have to really start thinking about and preparing for it. And we have a process. In um, a formal process where you, that you go through the semester before you you intend to go into practice, a uh, practicum. Well, great. Well, thank you for that, Dennis. Appreciate the updates. And uh, again, folks, if there are any questions about the Bachelor of Social Work, please uh, go ahead and uh, ask those questions in the uh, Q and A. Uh, so now, the next program is uh, the Political Science Program. 
Um, and we're going to invite Vanna to say a few words about uh, this uh, major in the Bachelor of Arts degree. Great. Hi, thank you very much. And good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Vandana Bhatia. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, and I'm also the undergraduate supervisor um, for our undergraduate program. And I'm really happy to be here today to tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so as people have already alluded to, um, we know firsthand that we're living in a pivotal time for politics and public life. Um, and it's clear that, that the COVID um, pandemic will have profound, long-lasting effects on the relationship between government and society. Um, effects that go beyond just dealing with the public health crisis, which is a significant part of it, of course, but also, um, you know, posing challenging fundamental questions about human rights, about governance, about the nature of citizenship and democracy. But even before COVID, we were faced with global events um, and issues like terrorism or international security, food security, climate change, mass migration, and of course, all of the long-standing domestic issues that need our attention as well. Relations with Indigenous peoples, the health of our population, wealth, poverty, inequality, among many, many others. So these are all complex problems and challenges, um, as well as opportunities, and they need fresh thinking and innovative solutions. So that's where you and I come in. Um, if you're curious about the world that we live in, if you want to learn more about it, and if you want to help to influence what's to come and how we deal with some of these challenges, then political science is the program for you. Um, our department's mission is to contribute to public life through our research and especially through our teaching. So our goal is to cultivate graduates who are knowledgeable and curious about the world, people who appreciate diverse perspectives and who are equipped and engaged as, as engaged and active citizens. So how do we do this? Well, Carleton has one of the largest departments of political science in Canada. Um, and so that means that we have a really diverse faculty with a wide range of teaching and research expertise. Um, and we provide a, a comprehensive range of courses and topics um, and programs of study for you to choose from. Over the first two years of our program, um, all students get a, a strong foundation in the discipline. Um, and so we have a set of core mandatory courses that everyone takes. These include introductory uh, politics and international studies courses. Um, we have courses in political philosophy that are also required in research methods and in Canadian politics. Um, in your third and fourth year is when you can really begin to specialize or concentrate your studies in, in a particular area. Um, our, our third and fourth year classes are smaller. Um, our third year classes about anywhere between 50 and 65 students and our fourth year seminars are capped at about 25 students. So you really have an opportunity to engage, um, get into discussions, do hands on work in in your classes. So once you reach your third and fourth year, um, you have an opportunity to um, to focus on a specialization in one of eight of our concentrations that we offer in areas such as Canadian politics, gender studies, political theory, public policy, international relations. You can also focus on particular regions of the world, um, so African studies, North American politics, European and Russian studies, for example. Um, and you can also develop your own path by choosing courses from a variety of fields um, that are tailored to your interests. So, for example, you could take courses in human rights and individual liberty. Uh, you could study globalization in terms of development, wealth and poverty. Um, we have a variety of courses that focal, focus on global politics of migration. So you could you know, take a different uh, a range of courses that kind of develop your interest in that area. Um, and we also have uh, a lot of expertise in development studies and, and the global south. So those are some of the ways that you can actually tailor the program to what you're interested in, what kind of you know career prospects you, you want to pursue. Um, and so, you know, you can really tailor it or you can 
delve deep into a particular area of specialization. And, and because we have the breadth of courses and, and faculty members to teach them, um, it gives you lots of options to work with. Um, and because we're in the nation's capital, we also have a lot of guest speakers and lectures from officials in government, from embassies, from international and national organizations that come onto campus, that come into the classrooms. Um, some of them some, uh, often teach uh, some of our courses as well. Um, and a number of our courses include experiential opportunities, um, simulations, case studies, and even field trips. So for example, in our course on the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, students observe a live hearing at the Supreme Court. Um, in our global environmental politics class, students have the option of doing a three-day field trip um, out to Lake Tamagami in Northern Ontario. So you can see the full range of co courses that we offer and even have a look at some of the course syllabi for for those courses on our website and they're always there so you can just you know have a look at them um, download one or two and, and you'll get a sense of, of you know the, the topics the, the kind of work that you'll be doing the kind of questions that you'll be um, looking into um, and it, you'll get a, a much better feel for the program that way as well. So over the course of the program, if you're an honor student, you'll take a total of nine credits in our department and an additional 11 credits as electives in other departments and faculties. In our three year program, um, students will do six credits in political science and um, and another seven as electives. In in our program, honor students are also expected to be proficient in a language other than English. So if you don't already speak a second language, you can take language courses as part of your free electives. Um, if you're going to specialize in Canadian politics, French has to be your second language in all of the other areas. Um, it can be any other language that you choose. We also have opportunities for students to get credits um, for internships that you can do, um, as well as co-op. So we have a co-op stream in our program as well, um, all of which count towards your, your degree requirements. Um, I can talk a little bit about some of the first year courses, the core courses that um, all, all political science students take. In our first year, uh, we have a, a course on dem democracy in theory and practice, um, and this course introduces students to basic uh, modern political ideas such as liberty, equality, the rule of law, uh, representation, political participation, and how these ideas play out and affect politics and policy making in Canada, um, as well as other countries around the world. Uh, we also have an introduction to world politics course at the first year level, um, and this course looks at politics in countries and regions around the world, um, looking at historical trends and, and current issues. Um, and you know, you explore different types of political institutions and political cultures. Um, you look at global issues, policies, and politics, as well as international relations between states, um, between international organizations, and and other actors. We have a couple of uh, first year courses that are um, sort of that span a number of different um, disciplinary areas, as well as as uh, as as well as uh, fields. So we have a course on technology, nature, and power. And this is a, a course that looks at how technologies like social media, self-driving cars, genetic manipulation, how these kinds of technologies have transformed the human experience um, as well as the natural world. So the course focuses on technological changes and how they've interacted with the social and political order and how they've transformed our environment. Um, we have a, a course on the politics of migration, and this course introduces students to concepts and theories that help to understand and explain some of the con complex patterns of, of migration that we see, including some of the social and political relevance of, of different types of migration and how they affect Canada, as well as other regions around the world, um, and, and the politics and, and the political responses to some of those trends. We also um, have three uh, in the fall, we're going to have three first year seminars, which um, Dean Plourd mentioned earlier, um, and these seminars are um, small classes that give you an op opportunity to delve really deeply into a particular subject, get some hands on experience um, and perhaps even do some uh, research and, and writing on on these topics. Um, 
I can talk a lot more about internships and co-op and, and experiential learning, but I'll leave that for the questions and, and I'll just stop here for now and see uh, what, uh, you know, what you're interested in exploring further. So thank you. Sure, thank you for that amazing update. And, and before we let you go, I, I really want to try to get this uh, question in because the student says that they are uh, coming to Carleton for sure and that poli sci is their dream program. So Yay. <laughs> uh, there you go. And, uh, and their question was about um, their experience volunteering in their uh, MP's office or member of Parliament's office. Yes. And they wondered if that would count toward uh, an internship or, or a co-op experience or, or anything like that. So if you could briefly kind of mention uh, how that would play out within their degree. Yes, so we do have a lot of students um, that that either volunteer or do internships with um, with politicians on the Hill. So that is certainly possible. We have an, an internship um, credit that is part time. It's, it's a part time internship, so three to six hours a week while you're doing your other coursework. Um, and that's something that you can certainly sort of carve out a, a particular project that you'd work on um, in the internship uh, while you're actually doing your other coursework as well. There's also the opportunity to do full time internships over a, a full term in the summertime or even in a regular um, academic term in the fall or winter. So those are things that that we definitely can ac uh, accommodate and, and can also fit into the co-op. So perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Vanda, for that update. And again, folks, if you have any questions about political science, uh, please go ahead and ask them in the Q&A. Um, our next program is our uh, Bachelor of Arts degree majoring in law. So our law program will be uh, spotlighted now. And I'd like to ask Zena to give us uh, an update on law. Thanks, Denley. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so my name is Zena Buzed. I am one of the instructors at the Department of Law and Legal Studies. I'm also the undergraduate supervisor. Um, I teach mostly in second, third, and fourth year. It really depends on the year, uh, so I'll probably meet you somewhere along the path of your degree. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about our program and uh, just telling you a little bit about it and your options. Um, part of my role as undergraduate supervisor is really thinking about your experience in the program, what benefits you, what courses you might be interested in taking, and also helping you think about your career planning, whether you plan to go to law school in the future um, or grad school, or maybe even want to join the workplace right after you finish your degree. So I'm always happy to chat about your career options. Our program, the Law and Legal Studies program, is an interdisciplinary program. It examines how the law shapes and is shaped by political, economic, social, and cultural forces. We are absolutely gonna study what the law is. There's been a flurry of legislation out from government recently, so we're gonna look at all the legislation, all the cases that are coming from the courts, but we wanna push you to start to critically analyze and solve legal problems on your own. So we want you to think creatively about what the law should be, what the law should say. And we want you to start to draw your own conclusions. Um, and we want you to think about how you come at uh, problems uh, in the legal arena by looking at the other opinions out there and, and learning how to think around those points of view. When you join our department, you're going to be joining Canada's largest uh, law and legal studies program. We have we just celebrated our 50th anniversary a couple of years ago, and our approach to the law is a really diverse, unique approach to the law. And so you're going to meet over 35 faculty members with very different research, um, academic and uh, work experiences. We offer about 70 courses each year. And again, that's by far the most course options that you're gonna have in any law and legal studies program. Um, you have the options of taking a huge variety of courses. I'll just give you a few options uh, that might interest you. As for example, if you're interested in criminal law, we have courses on sentencing, policing, criminal justice reform, drugs and the state, uh, criminal jury trials, if your interest is more in the business law field, we've got courses on international trade regulation, banking law, regulation of corporate crime, intellectual property, employment and labor law. Uh, if you're interested in human rights, we have courses on equality and discrimination, immigration and refugee law, 
freedom of expression, the law of armed conflict. And of course, we have a, another set of courses in many areas of law. So for example, constitutional law, environmental law, Aboriginal justice, family law, health law. So again, we really do specialize in many of these areas. Every year we run a series of special topics courses that offer a unique opportunity to examine an area of law that we don't traditionally focus on. So for example, this year we had a course on ocean challenges and international law, another course on wrongful convictions. Uh, this year coming up, we're going to have a course on sports and the law. Um, we offer three concentrations, uh, business law concentration, the law policy and government concentration, and transnational law and human rights. These concentrations give you an opportunity to really focus uh, a little bit more on the courses that you want to take related to that particular field. We have a co-op option with the business law concentration and the law policy and government concentration. And of course, uh, you have the option there of working in many organizations around Ottawa. Um, you've probably already heard about the international exchange opportunities, uh, but there are, I think now, over 175 partner institutions with Carleton. Uh, several of those are law schools, so many of our students have gone on to uh, do credits uh, at uh, US, UK and um, uh, law schools in Australia in particular. Um, just recently, we signed an agreement with a law school in Brussels. And so we're really excited about that opportunity because it gives students to also uh, complete an internship while they're there, which is a really unique uh, opportunity. There are opportunities for some of our fourth year students to work as research assistants for professors and help them do their own research and get course credit for that. There's an opportunity uh, for us to help our students with their publication of some of their fourth year papers. There are work placement opportunities as well, again, for our fourth year students to work in a law related field. Um, many of our students, uh, some that I supervised this year, worked at the various law firms around Ottawa. Uh, some of them also worked um, in uh, law enforcement. So one in particular was with the RCMP's uh, trafficking unit. Um, others worked in local businesses that were looking for legal analysts. Um, and then finally, there's a really active student organization, the Carleton Law and Legal Study Student Society. They are run by our students. Um, it is a huge organization. They put on social events every year, and they also run information sessions um, about law schools and law school preparation. They also visit some of the law schools around Canada. So it's a really good opportunity to get to know your peers. I think I'll stop there, Stanley, if there are any questions. Yeah, there are. There are a couple of questions in here. So um, first, there was a question about um, the number of law classes that a student would take in year one. So how many law courses are required in year one? Yeah, so in your first year, you're going to take our two uh, introduction to legal studies courses, one in the fall and one in the winter. These are an, an overview of law in general. So we will talk about some issues in criminal law, in business and private law and things like contracts. Um, we'll look at social justice issues and human rights. Uh, we'll focus in on Aboriginal justice concerns. We'll do a little bit of legal theory and we'll talk about the constitutional issues. So that'll be split up over the two uh, classes that you'll take in first year. And then another question that came up, I think after they heard you speak of, of all of the different areas that students can study in, uh, the question was about uh, being able to tackle more than one. So can you pick uh, more than one area of law uh, to study uh, throughout your degree? Yeah, absolutely. So you have the option of, of enrolling in one of these concentrations. So if you are really interested in business law and you know that's the area you want to focus in on, of course, you can enroll in that concentration and that allows you to target those courses. Um, but for the majority of our students, they are not enrolled in a concentration. They prefer to do an overview of many areas of law. So once you enter third and fourth year, those options of what courses you can take really open up. So if you have some interest in business law, you can take that course. But if you want to look uh, at a course in environmental law, you can take those courses as well. So it's really open to you at that point to kind of pick and choose from the areas of law that you want to focus on. The program is very broad um, in the course offerings, but if you want to narrow it down to an area that interests you, you also have that option. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you, Zena, for that great update. And uh, again, folks, if there are more questions about our law program, we'll still be uh, able to answer those questions through the Q&A. So 
uh, please uh, uh, send those questions to us. Um, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So our next area is going to be our Bachelor of Arts degree majoring in European and Russian studies. And I'd like to ask Jeff to uh, say a few words about this awesome program. Thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks to all of you who are who have stuck around. I know it's been a, a really fascinating conversation with all these different programs. I'm really excited to follow upon them and uh, give you a sense of what our program is like and why you should really be fascinated by Europe and, and Russia. Uh, and I would follow my colleagues at saying uh, this is a, a challenging time for all of us, but a really fascinating transition and, and it's never been more pertinent to really understand things like the European Union and what's going to happen to it. Is it, is it even going to survive um, this crisis and certainly not in the form that it had? Uh, a few months ago, those of us who were looking at Russia were thinking of Putin running for our next and uh, running indefinitely to be president until 2036. And now all of a sudden he's lost control, it seems, of the COVID crisis in the country. So there's just so many fascinating things to think about when you're looking at Europe and Russia. And for our bachelor's program, we have a standalone Bachelor of Arts and we have a stream in the Bachelor in Global, Global and International Studies. And really for both of them, <clears throat> the key to think about is these are really interdisciplinary programs. And they give you a sense to, to focus in on different areas that you want to look at. And that can be regional, if you're interested in Russia, you're interested in France, you're interested in Azerbaijan, Italy, <clears throat> Germany, um, the Balkans. Uh, you can look at the history of the region, politics, economics, culture, and we have courses that focus in both regionally um, and focus in as well thematically, anything from literature to transitional economics and these kinds of issues. And so really getting to know what's out there in terms of being an Ottawa for our capital advantage too, I think is critical to our program because we have so many fascinating connections to embassies, to um, government departments. And we have a number of students who go out to Global Affairs Canada, um, who go out to National Defense now, who are hiring a lot of our graduates. Uh, we also have events that are held in embassies, embassies who come to us. We have not only the co-op program, which a number of other units have talked about, but we have our own standalone internship program which is actually built into a class. So you learn career building school skills. You can do internships in uh, NGOs, um, Red Cross International, International Organization for Migration, NGO called SecDev, which works on cybersecurity in Russia, uh, or basically protecting us from Russia in some different cases too. Um, you can look at government departments. Um, you can look at serving staff in an embassy. So it's really a, a fun program to think about all the opportunities, even as you're a student. And certainly even when you come in the first year or two, it's a cozy program. It's, it's fairly small. You get to know faculty very well. Uh, we have a nice um, space in the river building. Our Richcraft Hall, as it's called now, overlooks the river. Uh, you get a chance to hang out in our in our office space, talk to our professors. We're really fascinated to hear what you have to say. Uh, the study abroad programs is, an, is another really fascinating opportunity that you get. And of course, through Carlton International, you can go to St. Petersburg, you can go it, to Italy, to Germany, to France, England, all of these different kinds of regions. And with our uh, alumni connections, and it's a really nice thing about our, our unit because it's small, our alumni are very dedicated to our students and they love to help out. Uh, we're able to position people to truly, really find out who's living in these particular cities, who can help you out. A lot of our students work abroad in Europe and Russia. We've had students who've gone over there as journalists, um, gone over there to, to, they start by teaching a language, uh, they start by um, just going and, and seeing what kind of opportunities are out there. They get involved in NGO work, um, humanitarian work. Uh, but a lot of our students will end up in Ottawa, in Global Affairs Canada, in National Defense. Many of them go on to law degrees. It's a great uh, degree to get a good interdisciplinary background to go into law or into master's programs and eventually into PhDs for some of you guys who are interested in continuing um, the academic track as well. But I'd say also it's just it's a program where you can have a lot of fun. It's it's a program where there's so many events going on on campus uh, in Ottawa and we really make sure to connect students 
to alumni who they might be interested in. There's a real sense of communication and excitement among the students because they're finally here to do something that they love. And they might be the one weird kid in their high school class who loves Russia. Um, and all of a sudden they get here and there's a whole bunch of other kids as well who are just fascinated. And it could be culture, it could be literature, it could be politics. Uh, it's really something that brings a lot of students together and allows them to explore their passions. Uh, I would say too that in, in terms of the faculty, we have such a great variety of people who work on anything from migration history to um, pluralism and, and how people get along in inter-ethnic settings to um, agricultural economics. And really, I, I think you can come here and then discover what you like to do. And sometimes you don't really have a sense when you're coming out of high school. Um, you, you have a vague idea that you like something about Europe. Maybe you traveled there. Um, but you don't really know and we'll have it. We'll, you'll, you'll get a chance to really explore all these different kinds of opportunities. And, and the last thing I would just say, uh, again, we're running, we're running later. I could talk all day, but I'll just talk about languages because that's a really critical part of not just our program, but in terms of getting employment skills and also in terms of just getting to communicate with other people and getting to expand your knowledge of the world. So our program has language requirements both in the begin stream and in the BA stream. Really pushes you out to learn a language from French to German, Italian, Russian. We'll give you assistance to do that. We have our own uh, alumni who come back and help to learn languages. Uh, and I think by the time you get out, if you come up with a language, you come up with these interdisciplinary skills, you really have a choice of different types of career paths that you can take from government to NGO, um, private sector consulting, risk management is another place that uh, a lot of our students are finding work in now. Uh, and then your, your, your pick of graduate programs, including RMA program, if you continue on. Um, so the world is really open to you and, and whether you're fascinated by Europe and Russia in particular, or whether you want an inter interdisciplinary program that's sort of grounded in a region and you haven't really found your way yet, uh, it's an exciting thing to, to be looking at, to be thinking about. Um, and just take our courses too. If, if some of you who are uh, interested, we have a Euros um, 1000 level course, Introduction to Europe and Russia and the World, um, 2000 and 3000 level courses, which are based in politics and literature, and then all the other courses we have that are regional or thematic. Um, but I'll stop there and see if Sten has anything for me. No, that's great. And actually, you're, you're, the last part there uh, feeds into uh, the question we have, which is about um, graduate opportunities and how the program sets students up for uh, for those opportunities. So maybe you can touch on uh, some of the different kind of graduate programs that students have gravitated towards after completing their uh, their bachelor's of arts in European Russian studies. Sure, yeah, that's a great question. And really, again, because we're an interdisciplinary program, students can be trained broadly and they can either hone in on um, something they found in their um, <clears throat> undergraduate degree, if they really find their fascinating history, for example, they go on and specialize in that for their master's or political science. But other students who more have a thematic interest, they can look at programs in migration studies, um, they can look at programs in, in more broadly international affairs, international economics or something like that. A number of our students have gone, in, gone to Europe, um, some of our students have gone to do journalism. Uh, we also have our um, our own MA in European and Russian European Russian and Eurasian Studies, it's called, uh, which is another great path too. So we really, um, when students get to their third year, just start to talk about talk to them about what they're thinking about, uh, not pressuring them in any way, but just saying, you know, these are some of the kinds of things our alumni do, and put them in touch with the alumni who have gone on these MAs or gone on to the the PhDs or law school, the working world, and they get to, get to chat with them, really think about what they're excited about. I mean, the first question I always ask students is really, what do you want to do? Like, what is, really gets you excited? And then we'll we'll help them find an MA program that matches. Awesome, now there was a question that came up about uh, double majoring. So this student uh, finds that uh, European Russian studies, it sounds really interesting, but they, they also have an interest in law. So. Um, what's the possibility of combining kind of those two areas or other areas uh, with European and Russian studies? 
Yeah, it's actually pretty frequent and exactly for the reason that, that you might think, right? Students have an interest in Europe and Russia as a region, but also have a particular disciplinary interest. So we've had students do double majors in Euros and law, Euros and political science, Euros and history, um, Euros and English. Um, so if they're interested in literature um, and there is definitely a method to do that. And we have a really strong um, advising culture here. We really get students close to their faculty members and we can make sure they keep on track to, to really follow what they want to pursue. Perfect, so we'll leave it at that. Um, thank you, Jeff, for that awesome update. And uh, and folks, if you do have any questions for Jeff um, or for anyone uh, of the programs that you heard of today, um, please uh, do use the Q&A. We'll keep the Q&A open for the next few minutes. So definitely get your questions in um, at this time. So uh, thank you so much, Jeff, again, for, for that update. Thanks, Dan. All right, so we are now at the uh, the end of the live portion of today's event. And I got to tell you, again, it was a really great time for, for me to, to look back and reminisce on the program that I came out of and the faculty that I graduated from, um, and also to give you guys a glimpse into what your future is going to look like uh, on our campus, uh, at our school, uh, and in your specific uh, program of uh, interest. Um, now, our webinar series can will continue tomorrow. Or we're going to be touching base with our Faculty of Arts and social sciences, and you'll hear uh, more about that by visiting our website, uh, missions.carlton.ca, and visit the CU at Home page. You'll also find information on other webinars are going to be happening over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have our uh, resource week happening next week, so we'll touch base with our financial aid uh, office, our student experience office, the Paul Minton Center, and, and other areas too, so definitely look out for that. And if there are any questions at all um, after today's session, uh, please uh, go on to our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook, and of course our admissions website, admissions.carlton.ca, and make sure you send us those questions. We're here to help you and to make sure that you are feeling good about uh, your post-secondary future. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next time you'll see me on uh, line will be uh, next Tuesday for episode three of the Talking Raven. So hopefully we will see you there. Uh, my name is Stanley Philippe, and we will see you soon.